What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Logical, Plausible, Probable. Tonight, I've got the one and only Sal Cordova uh, with me. He's going to be talking about Muller's Limit and the U Paradox and how a lot of that relates to uh, genetic entropy and just a variety of issues that plague the uh, world of evolutionary theory and uh Abiogenesis. I mean, just a plethora, plethora of things that this whole issue can run into. And then we've got Walker, also known as the Walking Fish. Uh, he's a friend of Sal's, and uh, he is a student in evolutionary biology, I believe. And yep. I think he's going to ask Sal a few questions after he gives his lecture. So uh, here in just a minute, we turn it over to Sal Cordova, and uh, he's going to actually share. Uh, we're going to try anyway. Uh, he's going to share a video from uh, the one and only Dr. John Sanford. Um, inventor of the gene gun for those of you who are unaware and uh, who Sal works for directly. And then he'll be diving into his presentation on those topics. So what, Sal, thanks for taking the time and uh, the floor is yours. All right. If the uh, screen share doesn't work, I have it. Uh, has it, has it come up? Uh, I tried to share it. Yeah. That's All right. I'm going to play. Uh, did it allow audio to come through? I personally can't hear very well. Can you, John? Uh, I think the audio is gone. I'm going to stop sharing. So we'll. Uh, we'll, we'll me. Did, did, did the audio come through? It wasn't for me, no. Uh, logical, you're uh, muted here. Uh, uh, no, I was hearing very, very low uh, audio. Um, do you have it over on your website? Yeah. Uh, Evidence and Reasons channel. It's on your YouTube channel? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. Do you want me well, to... No, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was on, you were saying your website or your uh, YouTube channel. Let me uh, pull it up. I may, able, I may be able to do it. While I'm looking for that, uh, why don't you... Tell us a little bit more about what's going to be going on tonight while I'm trying to find that video for you. So, okay, the evidence and reasons YouTube channel. If not, I'm going to be presenting on uh, Mueller's limit and the U paradox. So let me go ahead and start sharing. Um, let me get that video. Let me get my PowerPoint up. And. So thanks to the audience for forbearing. And I'd like to greet all the uh, uh, the viewers who've come out to this discussion. This will be nerd heaven for some of you. All right. Mueller's limit and the U paradox, the implications of Mueller's 1950 landmark paper uh, our load of mutations. Uh, some people have criticized me for citing this because it's 70 years old, but it still has influence on on a lot of population genetics to this day as it pertains to the questions of things like junk DNA and genetic entropy. So from Dan Grauer's uh, bioarchive paper, uh, 2016, the uh, rubbish DNA, the functionless fraction of the human genome. I'm going to quote directly from Grauer. He says, studies have shown the genome of each human newborn carries 56 to 103 point mutations that are not found in either of the two parental genomes. If 80% of the genome is functional as trumpeted by ENCODE Project Consortium 2012, then 45 to 82 de deleterious mutations arise per generation. For the human population to maintain its current population size under these conditions, each, is, each of us should have on average three times 10 to the 19th to five times 10 to the 35th, that is, I'm, I'm not gonna read all those zeros, uh, children, that's a lot of children. 
This is clearly bonkers. If the human genome consists mostly of junk and indifferent DNA, if the vast majority of point mutations are neutral, this absurd situation will not rise. Um, a question just came up, is this Mueller's ratchet? No, it's not to be confused with Mueller's ratchet. Uh, this is a term I coined to talk about the number, Mueller's limit. You won't find it in the literature uh, under that name. It's in the literature, but not under that name. Mueller's limit is my term for it. So uh, apologies to those I may have confused, uh, but I coined the word to help make the idea a little bit clearer. So Grauer said, <clears throat> if ENCODE is right, you have all these problems, it's clearly bonkers. So he's a mainstream scientist and he's just laying out his issues with the ENCODE project and consortium. And in 2013, he spoke at the Society of Molecular Biology and Evolution and then also the Spanish Society, which is equivalent, uh, I mean, a counterpart. And uh, it was about ENCODE and junk DNA. He wrote on his slide number 16. By the way, I'm going to make, uh, you can find uh, uh, an earlier copy of this slideshow on the website evidenceandreasons.com. Just click on the Cardinal Cordova debate. You'll find it. I'm going to update the link with this current slideshow. Uh, the, the one that's there right now is just a little archaic, but you'll get a lot of the references. So um, Dan Grauer, this is where he said, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. And again, it's based on the reasoning that was just outlined in his paper. Um, Dan Grauer called uh, the ENCODE Consortium and also the director of the ENCODE Consortium and the, and the director of the NIH. He called, he had names for them. He called them ignoramuses, crooks, scientific equivalent of Saddam Hussein and the creationist director. So he's not very happy. Now, um, I'm going to cite also another this is probably one of the most respected, Joe Felsenstein uh, on the upper left corner. He's one of the most respected population geneticists living today. He teaches at the University of Washington. He had some comments in his textbook, Evolutionary Theoretical Genetics. He writes, the mutational load calculation continues to be relevant to understanding wh whether most eukaryotic DNA has any function that is visible to natural selection. Recent announcements, <clears throat> ENCODE Project Consortium 2012, that 80% of the human DNA is functional based on finding some, based on finding some transcription or binding of transcription factors in it are very misleading. Junk DNA is still junk, however, however often its demise has been announced. Now there's a little bit of an uh, interesting uh, backstage drama here. Joe Felsenstein was teaching at the University of Washington when he made those statements. And amazingly, one of his colleagues, one of his colleagues at that very same university, John Stoya Tom, Stoy, uh, Stamatoyanopoulos, John Stamatoyanopoulos, uh, is also at the University of Washington as a genomics researcher, and he is an ENCODE researcher too. So, uh, uh, Joe Felsenstein actually interacted with him and published some of his interactions on the internet and said, well, the two disagree. So this is very interesting. At the same university, uh, we'll have two professors not agreeing with each other about this. So there, uh, this is a, a, an interesting fracture uh, in the biological community. But uh, all this to highlight this whole thing of mutational load, um, it's very important to certain quarters of ev evolutionary biologists that uh, ENCODE is wrong. Now, a little bit about the ENCODE consortium. Uh, they were a follow-on to the Human Genome Project. Uh, they had probably a, a budget of, by now, a total budget of over $500 million, I'd estimate. And uh, despite being called crooks and ignoramuses, the NIH basically ignored what Dan Grauer had to say because now there are all these follow-on projects that proceeded out of ENCODE, like 4D Nucleome and all these others. <laughs> all right, so basically they just ignored Dan Grauer. And I was at the ENCODE 2015 
uh, research applications, research applications and users conference. And there's not a single mention of this controversy. They they just brushed it off. They don't care what he has to say. It's not important to their research. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the ENCODE, uh, the 4D Nucleome project. The, I call it the son of ENCODE. But there's also a related project um, called the uh, E4 project, enabling exploration of the eukaryotic epitranscriptome. That the reason this is important is this um, may actually explain what the purpose is of some of the uh, RNA transcripts that we think uh, some people have just called junk. It may have to do with post-transcriptional modifications, and there's a set there. <clears throat> and there, this is linked to disease if these post-transcriptional modifications don't happen on the RNA. I should mention that there is some reasonable speculation that the generation of all these RNA transcripts is implementing some sort of neural computer inside the cell. So it's really too early to be declaring this as junk RNA. So this was John Sanford's lecture, October 18, 2018, at the National Institutes of Health. Contrary to some uh, false rumors on the internet, he was invited and the government paid for that visit and he was put in the most prestigious auditorium. Uh, he has supporters in the NIH because they're concerned about her heritable diseases. Um, so if, uh, let me see what the next slide is. In that, uh, I actually helped Dr. Sanford prepare this slide. That's why I'm familiar with it. Uh, you see where it says uh, 1 minus e to the 10 to the 80th. I highlighted it there and the word bonkers. That's alluding to what um, Dr. Grauer had said in Rubbish DNA. So that's an allusion to that. And what we're going to cover tonight is trying to explain the meaning of those numbers. So you could see the, all these numbers here, e to the minus 10, e to the, I highlighted it in green e to the minus 25, e to the minus 80, and how those numbers are calculated. So earlier, if you look at um, u is the number of mutations, of new deleterious mutations per individual per generation on average, on average. So um, when Dan Grauer said about 82 mutations, if you do some, some of the math and, and what this is about tonight is to explain what the formulas mean. So anyone, please interrupt me if I'm being confusing. This is uh, uh, the goal here is to try to explain the math. Independent of whether you accept creation or not, I'm just going to give a histor mostly a historical and math lecture on what evolutionary biologists themselves have said. So this is um, what's unfortunately happened is they uh, many people on the internet have tried to pin these numbers on John Sanford, and I'm like, no, this is from this is from evolutionary literature. Okay, this is not John Sanford's theory originally, and he confided to me uh, in a um, interview I gave, a public interview. He said uh, when he was still an atheist, his professor said the one thing that bothered him that's an unresolved problem is this thing of mutational load. And that actually, after John Sanford became a Christian and a creationist, uh, he began th that those words by his professor uh, uh, came back to his uh, mind. And that's where genetic entropy, his thesis was born. But it's born in evolutionary literature. So I'm trying to emphasize these numbers are not by Dr. Sanford. This is from evolutionary literature. And that's what we're going to cover, how this formula is derived. So Mueller in 1950 said, OK, if we have one mutation per individual per generation. Uh, if we put it through these numbers, each female has to have, on average, 5.4 kids. Nachman and Kroll in 1999 said, well, we estimate the mutation rate is about three deleterious mutations per individual per generation. But they said that's kind of hard to reconcile because uh, each female would have to have 40 kids. And then and code came out and said, well, there's all this functionality, and that would mean 82 of, uh, there'll be 82 deleterious mutations per individual per generation, and that results in a number on the order of 10 to the 35th. Okay, so these are not 
numbers that Dr. Sanford made up. He's merely citing existing literature. So you'll see this, this kind of one minus e to, the, to some power. That number here, like minus 25, minus 80, minus 10, that's you. That's the number of mutations per individual, per generation on average. And you'll see this formula. This is uh, one minus e to the minus u. And that is in uh, Walker, hmm? Iron Walker, and Caitlin. <laughs> Sorry, talking to me for a second. Wait, oh, sorry. That's uh, Michael Nachman and Susan Kroll, 1999. All right. So you'll see that they said 40 offspring. Uh, they, they say 40 offspring. And so that corresponds to the number I just cited here, Nachman, Nachman and Kroll. If that's 40.2, but just rounding off, they said 40 offspring. You'll see 1 minus e to the u. And that's from this paper. And then you'll see this. Same formula here, one minus e to the u. So this is so when people see Dr. Sanford's lecture and they see that that wasn't his formula that was made up. He's just quoting the literature. That you'll see this one minus e to the minus u. And so the reason I call this talk the u paradox is it's based on this uh, variable that they call u, which is the number of mutations per generation per individual. Any questions so far? Hope that's clear, John. Makes uh, makes a lot of sense to me so far. The uh, so I guess we are one of the things you're kind of just setting up here as you're diving into, into this with more detail is that for anybody who has questions of your oh he's coming at this from uh, a non uh, secular peer reviewed perspective uh, I would say that you've pretty much shown that to be uh, false and you're just following the math based on the established accepted formulas. Is that correct? The, that's correct. I mean, <clears throat> I could give this whole talk without even citing Dr. Sanford, but I, I'm relating, I'm presenting what Dr. Sanford had said and showing he, where he got this, okay? So whether you agree with the way he's used it, he's, he's citing respected evolutionary biologists and population geneticists. This is not, this, this is um, what I find unfortunate, will, will people just try to discredit his work and say, well, that's what he said. He's a creationist. It's like, no, th this is the work of other evolutionary biologists. Now, to be fair, and I'll explain, there's some other rescue mechanisms that they try to invoke, but the one of choice is to say that DNA is junk. So <clears throat> from this paper by Adam Meyer Walker and Peter Cately, there's an interesting, you'll see that, um, let me show you, uh, I'm sorry, apologies for having to go back and forth. You'll see reference five here and reference four. Okay, reference five pertain, and I'm gonna show their bibliography. Reference five returns, refers to Mueller's Our Load of Mutation, that, that famous 1950 paper. And then it also will refer, and, and Mueller was a Nobel Prize winner. This was his, this was his baby uh, mutations. And uh, it takes a little bit of reworking the math. Um, it, it's The limit is approximately, for humans, not necessarily other species, the limit is 1.0 mutations per individual per generation on average for the humans. It's different for other species. So again, Mueller limit is not the same as Mueller's ratchet. That's a term that I, I coined, Mueller limit. Now, that limit, you'll see it again in Ono's 1972 Brookhaven Symposium uh, presentation. He had a paper it's really hard to get a hold of. Uh, this is where the word junk DNA came up with. The name of his uh, essay was So Much Junk DNA in Our Genome. And as far as we know, that's where the term junk DNA came from. And his justification for that was this uh, deleterious mutation rate per generation becomes 1.0. That again is Mueller's limit, right? So this isn't anything that I've made up. I made up the, I made up the, uh, the, the coin, I coined the term of what, uh, what I'm labeling it, but the concept has been there for ages. So 1.0 per generation per individual. So that's, uh, if it's beyond that, that's, what uh, what Ono 
uh, drove Ono to say most of our DNA is junk. And at that, that at the time, that'd be like say one to three percent uh, of the genome could be functional. All right. So uh, if you go back to some of the earlier literature, they're saying, oh, maybe 97% doesn't do anything. Uh, that's obviously changed. So um, um, you'll see in I Iyer Walker and Keatley's reference, they reference Kimura, Mutu Kimura and Marayama. And this is where we'll get the formulas where we calculate all those numbers. So this is all related and uh, I'm sorry I'm throwing a lot of math at you guys, but uh, maybe some of you all be in nerd heaven, all right? So this is uh, a clip from um, that paper, and this is the equation of importance, and I will cover that a little bit later, but I'm just- I'm Real quick, real quick, Sal. Sure. Um, Dan is asking, uh, Mueller's work applies to what kind of populations? I think you made it pretty clear that it's you're applying this to humans, correct? Oh, uh, th that paper, Our Load of Mutations, is almost specifically for the humans. So that's a good question, Dan. So, so this is focused on humans. That's why he won the Nobel Prize, because he was very concerned about uh, um, the effect of radiation on human beings. And I'll tell you what's really amazing. In 1950, if you read that paper, Our, Lo Our Load of Mutations, there are a lot of people that weren't sure heritable diseases were due to mutations. Uh, you, you'll see that where he's discussing this. Now, now that may seem just like horrifying that anyone there would even be a dispute. But this was before this was 1950. It wasn't until 1953 we had Watson and Crick in the molecular biology revolution. So there was a lot we didn't know. He was doing a lot of this without any of our knowledge of DNA. I mean, this is almost. I don't know that you'll see anything in that paper that even mentions DNA because this even though we knew the existence of DNA, it wasn't elucidated until three years later. So there's, this is amazing that he was able to, to do all this and then it's still sticking um, and it's still relevant. So anyway, um, I'm gonna walk through this math. It, 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 don't get intimidated, it's not as bad as it looks. But I, I'm just setting up where all my references are for people like James Downward, especially who might be complaining that I'm not citing my references. Um, also in Iyer Walker, uh, mm -hmm. the paper, they cite this interesting one, this interesting paper. Uh, it's in the journal Evolution, 1994. And he writes, the risk of population extinction from fixation of new deleterious mutations. All right. so. This whole thing of genetic entropy, this is not, people are trying to pin this, they're saying it's a creationist idea. It, it's not, it's not, okay? No. And Kondrashov is also cited by R. Walker. And this is an interesting one. Uh, see what it says in red, why have we not died 100 times over? So these concerns are being raised and then Kondrashov recently wrote the book, Crumbling Genome and Kondrashov was at the NIH. Uh, actually, he was a colleague of my professor at the NIH, just as FYI. I, uh, they, I believe they worked for Eugene Kunin. I knew my professor at the time worked for Eugene Kunin. So back to Mueller's Our Load of Mutations, 1950. And uh, this isn't clear. I'm gonna try to clarify what he means. He wrote there, it is interesting to note that the maximum possible value for eliminated individuals could not be more than about five times this minimum. It could be hardly above 1.0 as reckoned by the approximation method that in which correction is not made for overlapping. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff here that is maybe extraneous. But do you see that, that number again? 1.0, it could hardly be above 1.0. That's not exactly you, and um, it, it may be a little bit confusing, but I'll try to explain. So uh, it, it's really subtle what he's saying here. And, and we, can, we can go back and uh, talk about this uh, a little later. Just let me try to uh, show this by illustration. So um, let me back up here. So he had this thing where, uh, you see where he says it's 0.2? So if there's one in five individuals with a 
deleterious mutation, uh, we need to eliminate them. <laughs> it's kind of mean uh, in order to preserve the, the health of the species. I mean, if we're assuming perfect selection, 0.2. So I'm just going to use that figure and say 20% have bad mutations. So just imagine this is a population here of healthy and mutant people. 20% are mutant and 80% are healthy. Is there any problem with that? I'm just extrapolating Mueller's paper here. So let's assume perfect selection. And selection will be done by a terminator process. The V. Arnold Schwarzenegger there, hasta la vista, baby. And he's going to eliminate by selection one of the bad mutants. And he's going to eliminate the other one. Sayonara, muchacho. OK, so that one's gone. So then now we have a population free of mutants. That's if 20% of the population has mutants. Now this, this, uh, the remainder will go on. There'll be survivors. There'll be parents of the next generation. And the next generation will have their mutation. So it might, you know, models have it where there's some equilibrium of, you have mutants and then healthy. And then you just keep, every generation, you just keep cleaning out the, the mutants. The problem happens. What happens, though, if it's higher than 20%? Let's say it's 100%. What are we going to do? See, let's say everyone has a mutation. What are we going to do? I mean, we can't wipe them all out, right? That's going to be problematic for selection. To be fair, there have been some suggested rescue mechanisms, and I'm not going to cover it here, such as soft selection and synergistic epistasis. So some of the people that I quoted um, above that were concerned for, uh, you know, they don't know how they could, humans could deal with all this. They suggested synergistic epistasis. And I'm not going to cover that in this lecture. I'm just, I'm just trying to show the math of how, that highlights the problem that needs to be fixed. Whether these mechanisms of soft selection or synergistic epistasis are adequate to solve this problem uh, is the subject of another discussion. But I'm trying to point out there will be a problem if there's too many mutations. It's just as simple as that. I mean, that's simple logic. If, you, if, if, if there are just too many mutations per generation, the, the human genome is going to deteriorate. And that's what Mueller was analyzing. So back again, this is, this is an active... This is an active disagreement with professors at the same university because on one side, we have guys like uh, Stamatoyanopoulos at University of Washington saying, oh, the genome's functional. And he signed that uh, paper that said 80% is functional. And then we have Joe Felsenstein on the other side saying it's not, that it's still junk. So uh, what I showed with that one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I was trying to show pictorially what this is saying by Mueller. Okay, gr granted, Mueller was not writing to the same audience I'm speaking to today. So some of the wording is a little bit obscure. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about this Mueller's limit, it, it, it's independent of our definition of function. It's independent of our definition of function. I'd like to thank Dan for reminding me of this PNAS paper, uh, April 29, 2014, defining functional DNA, DNA elements in the human genome. So there's the evolutionary definition, which I say is faulty and meaningless, and I'm sorry to offend people. That's how I feel. That might, that might be one of the more objectionable things I'll say today. But we could say there is an evolutionary definition, okay, independent of my qualitative evaluation. There's an evolutionary definition. There's the genetic perturbation definition. And then there's the biochemical definition. And those were outlined in this paper here by uh, many people in the ENCODE consortium. And I see some names that uh, um, I actually probably have met when I was at the ENCODE 2015 conference. I have been proposing this structural definition and that's based partly on the work of 4D nucleome, et cetera, and then also some of my work. I'll point out that Darwin himself used a structural definition 
So we had this, uh, there was a big mathematical problem that was outstanding until 1999. And um, th this is what it states, the honeycomb conjecture. The honeycomb conjecture states that a regular hexagonal grid or honeycomb is the best way to divide the surface into regions of equal area with the least total perimeter. The conjecture was proven in 1999 um, by mathematician Thomas C. Hales, and that's the proof there. And Darwin uh, made this observation himself. He must be a dull man who can examine the exquisite structure of a honeycomb, so beautifully adapted to its end without enthusiastic admiration. We hear from mathematicians the bees have practically solved the recondite problem and made their cells of the proper shape to hold the greatest possible amount of honey with the least possible consumption of precious wax in their construction. And the reason I'm highlighting this is independent of whether this affects reproductive success or not, there's an optimality here based on pure math and physics. It's optimal. So that means changes to this physical structure, you can't make it better you can only make it worse. There's, there's an optimality to structure. So that's a hint of structural, we can describe optimality and quote unquote fitness independent of reproductive success. Now, how does this relate? We have here, the, this is a picture from the 40 Nucleome Project and associated researchers. This is this interior of a uh, eukaryotic uh, cell, the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. And we'll just say for sake of argument, this is the human eukaryotic cell. And you could see here, there is kind of an outer part of the cell. And uh, let me see if it's labeled. Yeah, the, uh, the nuclear pore, it's called the nuclear pore, pore complex. And uh, associated with that are things called lamina. So, so structure is very important. Why do I say that? What if this is damaged? What if there is problems, if there are defects here, just on the edges here? Now, by the way, a lot of the DNA, the chromatin on these edges is often considered junk, but it's not, and I'll show you why. The structural part is important. If there are defects in that structure, uh, it causes premature aging. Uh, it's called a condition called progeria. I looked on the internet, uh, the life expectancy is age 13. Some people live to age 20. And this is, this is it, just from my textbook uh, at the NIH this past fall. Defects in a particular nuclear lamin are associated with certain types of progeria, rare disorders that cause affected individuals to age prematurely. Children with progeria have wrinkled skin, lose their teeth and hair, and often develop severe cardiovascular disease by the time they reach their teens. All this to say, this structural issue is really important. That's just one, I believe that that nuclear lamin is just one protein. That one protein was defected, it, it affected how this thing is structured. So structure is really important, and that's what the 4D nucleome is studying. I'm gonna take a little bit of an aside <clears throat> so, uh, so you see all these little lines here? I'm sorry if that's not clear. That's DNA. These are chromosomes. Each of the different colors are individual chromosomes. And they have to be structured. The way that they organize themselves so that they have the right geometry is based on what we call junk DNA. The repetitive elements are really important to getting these things to organize correctly. And that's very important for their uh, regulation because they have to be in correct geometric proximity. Like you hear, you have here this little uh, transcription factory. It could be among different, you see that? You have two chromosomes that share a transcription factory. They have to connect. So the repetitive elements help them to navigate and position themselves. If we just deleted those repetitive elements, or if we were throwing ERVs and signs in the wrong places, it's just gonna mess that up. It's just gonna mess that up. That's, that's, that's why when, they're, uh, when we have uh, transposons just randomly jumping, it's really devastating. The so structure is important. Uh, here's a recent 
uh, preprint, October 13, 2019. Um, I'm sure uh, because of the 4D nuclear home project, even though this isn't yet officially published, you could see quite a number of researchers were involved. I expect stuff to be published like this. I'm in con because I lived near Bethesda, Maryland before the lockdown. I used to regularly go up to the NIH and talk to some of my friends there. God bless them. There are creationists at the NIH, by the way. So <clears throat> just as a total aside, looking at Methuselah, before we get back to the math, I just want to give a little bit of a break here uh, to something interesting. Looking at Methuselah, we're looking at Methuselah the wrong way. We look at ourselves today as normal and we look, you know, we think, oh, all those people back then that supposedly lived long, they're, they're exceptional. No, 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 no. Uh, we look at ourselves at normal, but what if the, is the case that um, we are the ones who are prematurely aging? What if we're the ones who are like this poor child here that has progeria? We just have our version of it that makes us only live 80 years. That uh, maybe we were de designed to be uh, living thousands, if not immortally. And <clears throat> um, so just a rhetorical question, do we have defects in our DNA and cells that make us age prematurely? I mean, prematurely meaning we only live to 80 years old. Okay, that's just a rhetorical question. And that's kind of creationist. That's I'm deviating a little bit from evolutionary literature. I'll point out, <clears throat> we have animals like the hydra that are immortal, they don't age. That's just, that's just a data point, keep that in mind. We also have these immortal cell lines. We found some immortal cells. That you, uh, they're extracted from an African-American woman. You can find this on Wiki. It's called Gila. Um, she died in 1951, but her cells are still alive. They're immortal. I mean, granted they're cancer cells, but they don't die. And um, these considerations raise the question, uh, why did we not evolve to be to live forever? And this is uh, from Science News. It said, uh, I highlighted here, despite the obvious facts to the contrary, from the point of evolution, age, aging should have never happened. So I'm just throwing all that out. Um, we saw this graph in Dr. Sanford's book, uh, The Declining Ages of the Patriarchs to us today. But I'm trying to... Uh, but going back to uh, maybe something less controversial, there's no question the structure here is really important. And so I gave an example where structure affects aging. It affects all sorts of things. Just even a little damage to the structure with that nuclear lamin protein, uh, it, 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 if it's blown out, just really bad stuff happens. Very sad. So regarding structure, um, and this is setting up the math, but I'm, I'm trying to give physical examples before we get to the math. Regarding structure, with a tire, you could you could scrape off just a very minuscule fraction and it doesn't, it looks imperceptible, its effect on the fitness of the tire. But over time, uh, all these, all that scraping will eventually wear it down. So it may be that we're not able, you know, when we do these knockout experiments, I just laugh. I said, you know, well, yeah, we could, you know, hypothetically, you could take a piece of sandpaper and you know, scratch the tire for like say a minute in one spot and it's like, oh, the tire works fine. And then go to another part of the tire and scratch that and said, hey, it works fine. We don't need that layer. And, but you just keep repeating the process and uh, soon you realize all of that actually was functional, all right? So that's why I just laugh at these knockout experiments at saying, oh, you know, it didn't affect the phenotype. Wait, wait till you start knocking out enough. So, uh, that's why I don't like some of these definitions of fitness. So um, in some of my other presentations, I talked about the importance of the um, uh, uh, having the right, either the right geometry to affect either exact uh, perfect geometric fits or fits that um, have the right uh, specificity and binding affinity. And uh, Professor Cardinal is very kind to point out, I, I didn't phrase that as well as I could have. And uh, so I'll include that, the word specificity and uh, affinity. It's not always about having a perfect geometric fit as in like nuts and bolts. Uh, nuts and bolts is only a metaphor here. 
So this is where I said, again, structural biology kind of shows that um, um, you, you can either at best have a neutral mutation or a bad one. It doesn't improve. Now, in the debate I had with Professor Cardinal, he had some issue with uh, Dr. Sandford's interpretation um, of the distribution of mutations. Uh, this is a graph in Dr. Sanford's book. And uh, Dr. Sanford added this little thing here. Um, I'll point out that he said Dr. Sanford didn't interpret Kimura's paper correctly. I would dispute that now because I've actually gone through the math. And Kimura was actually, when Dr. Sanford was saying Kimura didn't really regard beneficial mutations, that's true. That's because of this formula here. But we, we don't have time for that this evening. So um, I'm just going to repeat myself just to go back a little bit. So in the English language, correct spelling is by convention. All right. So in a way, there's really no the correct spelling in English except by, you know, there's nothing in nature that says it has to be spelled this way. It's an English convention. But in biology, the correct spelling is according to physics and connectivity and performance considerations. It's like nuts and bolts fitting together. And uh, uh, as I showed with like, also like in the case of the honeycombs. And then physicist William Bialek has also come up with all these optimizing principles and saying, this is how it has to be built. If you have a system built with certain materials and it's of this size, this is the way we know what the optimal is. So what I'm saying is um, um, it's being studied by biophysicists and since my background is more in physics than biology, I, I have kind of a soft spot in my heart for biophysicists. So one thing to keep in mind, there are far, far more ways to misspell than to spell, especially for proteins. And I gave an example here. Now, granted, we can probably change some of these other spellings and it can tolerate it much like a tire. It, it doesn't mean that over, if you knock out enough that it's gonna still function. And what I highlighted in red here, this is really critical. If you knock this out, if you change the spelling here, it's gone. So, so there's some parts that are, are like, if you look at a car, there are parts you could scratch off like the tires tolerate, but if you cut the battery lines, it's dead. And proteins are the same way. So there are parts of the protein that are really, really critical. There are parts that might be able to suffer some mutation, but not too much. And that's a whole nother topic, protein probabilities. And because some people don't normally read letters like this and figure out what it means, I tried to give an English language example. And in my last debate, some people in the comments section were total numbskulls. I tried to dumb it down for them. And it was still, you're saying that's the dumbest thing I thought. And I said, well, it's dumb for people like you. I was thinking, I was really offended by what they said. So what I was really trying to say is I could either use protein spelling or I'm, I could illustrate it with English language spelling. And so it's kind of the same thing. If we had uh, an ingredients list for tiramisu, what will happen to that ingredients list if we apply natural selection to it, mutation and natural selection? So the, the red things, say, let's say we have at least one bad mutation per child. So this is the parent and this is the parent's children. Each of the children has, has at least one bad mutation. And Selection comes along and destroys the other children, which is really sad. Child number two ha has defects. And child number two uh, is now the parent in the second generation and we rinse and repeat. The next generation of children has even more mutations. And even if we apply natural selection and survival of the fittest, we've not cleaned out. So again, uh, if, <clears throat> If there are too many mutations per individual, its selection will be incapable of cleaning it out. I, I hope that at least the concept is clear. I mean, that, th that's really hard to run away from. And so I'm not gonna torture you all with any more generations, but by the nth generation, even if we're applying selection, you just get garbage at the end. So <clears throat> now, that was the easy part. Now kind of the more subtle details as it relates to the numbers that that U paradox, there's no guarantee of getting at least one mutation per individual. Okay, so it's very hard to actually guarantee uh, there's one mutation per individual. 
that we can estimate the average number of mutations per individual per generation. That number is called U, U, okay? That's just a convention. Um, it used to be, I think, something like maybe Lambda, but now we've changed it to U. So there's no guarantee of getting at least one mutation per individual per generation. But what we can do is you could say there's an average number. So let's say there's an average number of one mutation per individual. So that's 1.0. So here's the population of 54 individuals. You have 21 individuals that have no mutation. You have 21 individuals with one mutation. We have six here with two, four here with three, and one with four mutations, one with five. Now, the proportions here, it's like 38.9%, 38.9%, 11.1, 7.4, 1.9, That's approximately according to the Poisson distribution. If we apply a Poisson distribution of um, where we have an average number of mutations is 1.0, you'll get some with plenty of mutations. Uh, you'll get maybe a few with plenty of mutations and many with no mutations and many with one. In any questions so far on this diagram? This is probably the more critical one. Nope. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty obvious. There's probably a few dumbasses in the uh, chat that aren't getting it, but uh, they, they weren't able to get your uh, tiramisu uh, yeah. analogy either, but uh, this makes Sorry, sense guys, to, I can't, to, you know, to the I smart people. It, I, I can't dumb it down anymore for you guys, really. Sorry, I was really offended by that. You know, I, it takes a lot to offend me, but... Uh, we, 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 you know, when when they're just willfully ignorant and not trying to understand what's being said, it's like I give up. Sorry, you don't see me get angry very often, but I really took offense to that. So anyway. So what will happen now is if we want to try to preserve the population free of mutations, we're going to have to blast away. We have to send the Terminator in and the hasta la vista baby to all these that had mutations. So now the survivors will become parents of the next generation. Now, because we have an average rate of mutation of one per generation in this hypothetical example, the next generation will restore the equilibrium where we have, again, uh, the children uh, in this next generation will have approximately these proportions. All right, the, uh, again, these are only approximations because we're dealing, you know, this is a stochastic, uh, stochastically influenced um, model. So I talked about the Poisson distribution. <clears throat> so you'll see, we'll see stuff like, there are various ways that it's stated and it has different symbols. In modern population genetics, uh, they'll use symbology like this to describe the Poisson distribution. These are the Poisson frequencies. Uh, in the wiki article, it'll be like this. Now, don't be put off by the math. I'm gonna walk you through the examples and. If we get stuck, we can we can go back. But as I fill out the numbers, it'll make sense, hopefully. Now, in Kimura's paper that I cited earlier, the one that uh, Iyer Walker and Nachman Kroll and others have cited, this is how Kimura stated the Poisson distribution. And I'll show why these are really the same thing with just different symbols. So I'll just start with the wiki definition versus the population genetic definition. So you see the, the symbol I here is the, corresponds to the symbol K. So the population genetic definition, and I'm just gonna go through this so you could see it. So you'll see U, that's why I said U paradox, you'll see this. And all right, so I'm just, I'm just clicking through this so you could see the correspondence. It's the same thing, just different symbols. And if we take Kimura's paper, you'll see it's the same, it's the same idea. In Kimura, it was Lambda in modern literature now it's often u so e to the minus u you'll see that term a lot e to the minus u and then uh you, you, you'll see just some of the symbology is different but it's it means the same thing so we can go back to that so like i said when you see this don't try not to be too intimidated i <laughs> i had to read through this original literature to figure this out and that, that was kind of painful so let's try to fill this out with some numbers. So <clears throat> if we have an average mutation rate, be it one mutation per generation or 82 mutations per generation, 
Uh, we can estimate the proportion of individuals that have no mutations, that have one mutation, two mutations, three, four, and five, et cetera. And so we just put the, uh, that corresponds to this I. So I equals zero means it corresponds to the proportion of individuals with zero mutations. So far, so good? Okay. So I'm just going to fill out these formulas here with I equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, and put it in the diagram. So F U equals, F of U equals 38.9% and 38.9% here, approximately 11.1. .1. The numbers are not exact because this, this is such a small population size, 7.4. Uh, when we get to these higher mutations, the, the, the approximation really just falls apart. Um, so, uh, but it, it's pretty close here. It's pretty close here to the Poisson distribution. So uh, let's focus on this. This is very important uh, because we're just gonna eliminate everyone here uh, in a hypothetical scenario where there's 100% selection efficiency. So we wanna focus on the part of the population that has no mutations. And I'm gonna do that by setting I equal to zero. And I'll show that. So you see the I equals zero, you'll see it here and here. And all I'm gonna do is gonna, I'm gonna put zero. See, now it's zero. And if we do the math, you get E to the minus U. Right there. So does that look familiar? Remember the paper I cited earlier? This is from Nachman and Kroll. You see that little right here, E to the minus U. So I'm just trying to show this is where it came from, that E to the minus U, the Poisson distribution right there. So far, so good. So I'm trying to connect all the math together and where it comes from. So, and you'll also see that E to the minus U here, E to the minus U right there. I'm going to show what the one means later, okay? But again, in Dr. Sanford's presentation at the NIH, you'll see that E to the minus U. Where, so for 10 deleterious mutations on average per individual per generation, U equals minus 10. Um, for uh, for uh, 25 deleterious mutations per individual per generation, U equals minus 25. And if ENCODE is right, it's, it's minus 80, or minus 82 to be, spe uh, to be specific. So that's where the E minus U comes from. So uh, going back to Nachman and Kroll's paper, you'll see that term E to the minus U. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill this out why it's one minus E to the minus U and how all the math works out. So here's some trivial math. I'm sorry for the painful details. You have one equals one, right? That shouldn't be problematic. One equals one plus zero. No problem there, right? One equals one minus e to the minus u and plus e to the minus u. So this term here, all the way here is all zero. That, that shouldn't be problematic. So now I'll show you where that, how all this comes in. So I'm gonna put parentheses around this term here and we'll see, and now make it red. And that corresponds to what we've seen, this term one minus e to the minus u. And so what does this mean? So if we have the whole population here represented by the number one, the sum of all the proportions, we have the proportion of people that are non-survivors that have to be eliminated by natural selection. And then we have the proportion of survivors, which corresponds to the Poisson frequency of F, U, uh, and zero, F, U, zero, okay? I, I hope the illustrations sort of clarify, <laughs> okay? So this term corresponds to the guys that are eliminated, This term corresponds to the survivors. But these are in terms of proportions. E to the minus u will be some fractional number. Same here, uh, that's below one, between one and zero. Now what we have, okay, so one minus e to the minus u, and so now you see it right here in Iyer Walker's paper, one minus e to the minus u. And that's why we call this the u paradox. Because, why don't I read it? Where u is the deleterious mutation rate per diploid. 
So a high rate of deleterious mutation, U much greater than one, is paradoxical in a species with a low reproductive rate. Furthermore, if a significant fraction of new mutations is mildly de deleterious, these may accumulate in a population with small effective sizes or in populations which selection has been relaxed, leading to a gradual decline in fitness. It has been argued that accumulation of mildly deleterious mutant alleles could have long-term consequences for human health. Okay, so now I've tied all that math here and some of the concepts before to the idea that this is where human health is at risk if we have high mutation rates. Okay, so if we cannot agree on anything else, if we have high deleterious mutation rates, that's bad. That would be bad. So now what I'm gonna do, uh, we wanna, I'm just gonna convert the proportions into whole numbers because we, we don't wanna have like a point, you know, we wanna have whole numbers for individuals, not half a person, okay? Or, you know, one tenth of a person. We wanna make this a whole number. And it's very easy to do. I'm just gonna multiply both sides by E to the U. And this is what happens when we get e to the u. So if we have at least one survivor, we're going to have uh, uh, we'll have e to the e to the u minus one non-survivors. The total population, therefore, the number of offspring per parent has to be e to the u, so that we can have at least one whole survivor. Okay. So if we if this is a little murky here, uh, we can cover the math and um, because we're getting close to the end of this derivation. So e to the u is the total minimum number of offspring per parent. Now, <clears throat> it turns out since you need a, a mother and father to make a kid, uh, uh, the total number, uh, uh, so if we have like say, if we're required to have three kids per individual, uh, that really translates into six kids per couple or six kids per female, all right? Hopefully that's not too difficult. And so this explains how we get this here, this table. Number of required offspring per female. And I, I, I didn't correct my slide here. So this is U. This column is U, and this is the number of offspring. So when we have 82 mutations, we get on the order of 10 to the 35th. And that explains I'm trying to connect this to Dan Grauer's comment here. This is how he got that number, 5 times 10 to the 35th. I didn't specify exactly uh, uh, 5 times 10 to the 35th here. When I did the calculation for a uh, per parent, it's 4 times 10 to the 35th. I mean, it's close enough. I mean, what's, what's a few million here, here right? <laughs> when you're dealing with numbers that big. So that's how he got... Uh, he, he arrived at that number uh, with a slightly different set of calculations, but it very much agrees with the Poisson distribution I laid out. And he said, this is clearly bonkers. And Dr. Sanford in his NIH lecture quoted it here, 10 to the 35th. And so that's how the numbers were came out. And that's why Dan Grauer said, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. And he really took exception and he started calling, uh, uh, relating the ENCODE researchers and saying they're get, aiding and abetting the creationist. And he was really uh, angry about that. He said, if on the other hand, organisms are designed, then all DNA or as much as possible is ex expected to exhibit function. If ENCODE is right, evolution, then evolution is wrong. And I'll argue evolution is regardless. <laughs> Evolution is wrong regardless of ENCODE, and the reason is even if we use Dan Grauer's number that there are 10 deleterious mutations per individual, per, um, per generation, you still need 44,000 offspring. So that is my lecture. If you have any questions uh, about the math or anything else, um, that's it, and I'd like to thank all of uh, the viewers who've stayed with me so far. All right. I just have a quick question. Intuitively, right, if you're going to have 10 to the 11th offspring, wouldn't that mean generation one is already off the table, right? So doesn't that also not really fit a creationist worldview if you're going to have to have millions and millions of children? Okay. Uh, 
let me try to um i think that's a very good question and um i don't completely understand what you said this is what they call a reduct uh 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 either like a proof by contradiction or reductio ad, ad absurdum it's uh, what grower is saying okay let's just can we take the the uncode example yeah. Oh, I, I would love to talk to uh, talk about the Dan Grower paper if you'd like. But uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, let's take the ENCODE example, and maybe that can answer your question about this the smaller number of offspring. So what Dan Grower said is, if ENCODE is right, to avoid um, genetic deterioration, we need on the order of ten to the thirty fifth offspring. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not my words. That's well, Dan Grower said that you would need it for population replacement. Right. Not even just to avoid deleterious mutation, to even have a sustainable population for one or two generations. Right. So I'm just saying by way of extension, if we use the same math and just plug in the numbers for the number of so if the number of mutations we need, the number of mutations is 80, it really is 82. If it's 82, then we need 10 to the 30, 35th offspring. That's what Dan Grauer said. But if we use the same math and apply it with only 25 mutations per generation, we need 10 to the 11th. And if we only have 10 mutations per individual per generation, we need 44,000 offspring. So this is, this is what I framed independent of creation evolution. I'm trying to frame the problem of why someone like uh, Joe Felsenstein uh, said it has to be junk. So not only Dan Grauer, but then a textbook author, textbook evolutionary geneticist, one of the most respected. This is the reasoning why they're saying the genome has to be mostly junk, in the mm -hmm. sense that if we mutate it, it's gonna uh, most likely gonna be a deleterious mutation. So I know I didn't quite answer your question. I'm just trying. Maybe we can go a few rounds, and maybe I can try to oh, understand. You're good. You're good. Um, yeah. I will. Okay. So I'm not. I, I don't have any background in population genetics at all. Right. But I, I have read Dan Grauer's original paper, um, and he provides a little graph where it has uh, the functional fraction of the genome versus the deleterious mutation rate, and the resulting is the uh, the for total fertility rate that would be needed for population replacement. And I don't know where the derivation that you used went off with the derivation that Dan Grauer used, um, but they definitely did not give the same results, right? So like, let's say with 25% of the uh, function as a functional fraction of the genome with a deleterious mutation rate of 4.0 times 10 to the minus 10th, uh, he only got a total fertility rate of 3.4% or 3.4 offspring per female. See, and I don't know how he could come up with that. So thank you for pointing that out um, okay. because uh, do you know the citation offhand? Yeah, yeah, I have it pulled up right here. Uh, uh, it's an upper limit on the functional fraction of the human genome by Dan Grauer. I can upper limit on the functional fraction. Okay, I'll put it in the stream yard. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. So um, I'd like to thank Walking Fish for highlighting a paper that made it uh, oh, disagrees yeah. with a number, but. Does anyone have a problem if I said 82 mutations and I used my formula here? It's not really my formula, okay? Yeah. We arrive at the same number here. When it's 82, you get on the order of 10 to the 35th. And I'll point out Nachman and Kroll. If we take Nachman and Kroll's, uh, let me, let me, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to go all the way back. <laughs> but you're good. Uh, <laughs> This is like 160 slides because I tried to animate things. Uh, there's probably a more efficient way to do this than the way I've done it. No, th thank you very much for pointing that out. It's, it's worth me looking back. This is this is a good discussion. So all right, so for u equals three, okay, this is why I call it again the u paradox. U equals three. That means if we have an average number of mutations per individual per generation, if u equals three, the average 
uh, you need each female would need to produce 40 offspring. Mm -hmm. So if we go to this formula, what does the formula I provided give? It's 40.2, which is pretty much 40. So we have this number that's in agreement for three. We have this number that's in agreement for 82. That's why if we have like 10 or 11 mutations, I don't know how Grower could be saying we only need three people. It would have to be on the order of, because I, I have this number correct and I have this number correct. So I have to go back to that paper and see what he's talking about. Well, okay, so the way Dan Grower derives his equation, uh, he uses the average, uh, well, the average fertility rate is proportional to one over or what over the average fertility rate, sorry, is proportional to one minus two times u to deleterious to the number of functional nucleotide sites, or I guess sequence dependent uh, nucleotide sites. Okay. And then he just solves for f depending on how many, like the, the functional fraction. Um, okay, can I say this? I think yeah. you've put something on the table that's important enough. We probably won't resolve it in this discussion. I have to look at it. And I really uh -huh. want to thank you for providing that for me. Um, I'm, I'm sorry this may sound really, I'm not oh, trying you're good. to- good. <laughs> I I'm have like three be, papers I'm not, that I'm I've not heard trying to be, Yeah. I'm not trying to be too derogatory, Grower, but I just stopped reading his stuff. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> you're um, good. Hey, Sal, uh, so uh, Creation Miss has a question for you. Um, does everyone in, I'm going to pop it on the screen here. Uh, does okay, computer? Does everyone in the po in this population suffer equal fitness costs each generation, or is there variation in cost as the mutations accumulate? Does everyone in this population suffer equal fitness costs each generation? Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. That's a good question, Dan, and I'm I'm really sorry I can't answer it. Or is this a variation in costs as the mutations accumulate? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. What I've tried to highlight, and, and I'm, I'm I'm really sorry, Dan, your question deserves an answer. And um, that aspect in those terms that you just use, it's something I'm not familiar with. I've tried to give kind of, I kind of like simple arguments. I've tried to make a simple argument here where we just say, if we have this number of mutations, uh, then this is how many kids that we need. I mean, that was um, Grower's argument. So there was some mention of some other rescue mechanisms like soft selection so, and- So he expanded a little bit here. Does yeah. that help make, it, make any more sense? Basically, does everyone get equally worse each round or some mutations slash combinations worse than others in this model? Let me think on that. Does everyone e uh, get equally worse each round or some e worse than others? In this model where we have perfect selection, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's independent of that. The, the, problem, the problem doesn't go away. You can assume either. Assume it one way, assume it another. You still get genetic deterioration. So now, uh, and there was simulations on that. Can you uh, pop that back up there? I want to. I want to read it. That's a very. This basically does everyone get equally worse each round or some? Um, what we have modeled, uh, what can be modeled, and this was done with uh, Mendel's accountant, and I recommend that it be modeled with another piece of software. Uh, you don't have to use Mendel's accountant. Let's just model it where everyone's not equally worse. And that would actually be an accurate model because um, we see in our population, there are people with more heritable diseases than others. So they're not equally worse. And in fact, um, if they're not equally worse, that, that may actually cause some more complications because that means selection is not working with 100% efficiency. So that's, uh, So basically, does everyone get equally worse with each round or some mutations worse than others? in this model. This model doesn't address that. That question is independent of this model that I presented. What we'd have to do is we'd have to take this model and then build two different models on top of it, where it's one where they're equal and one where they're not. 
The one that Dr. Sanford built with Mendel's accountant is where we had some that were not, that were much worse off than others. And he was modeling what they call synergistic epistasis, where you had some people that had just, um, they, had, they, they were worse off than others because they happened to have a gene combination that uh, uh, kind of truncated them out of the population. To give an example of what synergistic epistasis may mean, in some aircraft, uh, piston-powered aircraft, you have two magnetos that, power, that are connected to the spark plug. So in case there's a failure in one spark plug uh, in the piston, the other spark plug can take over. So the airplane will fly pretty much, it'll fly cl close, not, not exactly to, uh, to its peak performance. Not exactly, but close. Good enough to get the pilot home. But if you have two of the magnetos fail, uh, then the plane will lose its engine. So there are, uh, that's what synergistic epistasis is. It's just like you can tolerate maybe uh, one mutation in one gene by itself, and then uh, in another individual, they have an, another gene that goes bad. But if you have an individual that has both genes simultaneously go bad, then it's really severe. Um, and that's synergistic epistasis. So when we tried to model that, when Dr. Sanford tried to model that situation uh, and you got truncation selection, it still didn't help. So uh, it may be an open question. Kondrashov was the one who advocated the idea of synergistic epistasis and it's worth looking at. But I mean, just, you know, when I, when I was showing, I, I, I mean, you could imagine like, if, if every child had a hundred mutations and, and you get the situation where let's say each child inherits, okay, let's say each child inherits 40, I mean, 82, each child, 82 mutations that the parent didn't have. I don't know how that, I don't know any way that selection could be, could work that it could clean it out. I mean, you, you'll have to have this scenario. I, I just I mean, don't. I, I agree with that, and that's why I think the majority of the mutations aren't deleterious. They, they physically can't be. That was the point that Grower was bringing up. And actually, you know, this is great because we, we actually have kind of like, you, you actually see the problem now very clearly, why there yeah. has to be junk DNA. And, you know, if we, we may not agree on a lot of things, but we can at least, this goes back to Ono's paper here, this one. This is where the whole thing came up. So maybe we're at least, we may disagree on a lot of things, but this is where the issue is really, at least we have agreement that if, if the genome is mostly functional, that's problematic. And, and maybe that's um, as far as we can go. Um, and, and that's why I did take some time to talk about some of the structural issues, uh, this, the 4D nucleome project um, and I'm sorry to be going through all these slides here. I don't have, um, uh, let me just un, un, unshare here. So, so that's my, that was my attempt to um, at least go through the math and say, this is what the literature says, and this is what it all means. And um, mm -hmm. I, I hope at least I did a good job of trying to explain what the math and the symbols mean and how the numbers were arrived at. No, it, it made total sense to me. I mean, you, what you're suggesting is, okay, obviously, like in every model, which obviously every aspect of evolutionary biology uh, and phylogenetics and every single one of them, they're all doing math based on formulas, right? The And models. So you always have to create some sort of foundation uh, to look at. I think what you're suggesting and showcasing here is that even if necessarily all the negatives don't hit at the exact same time, you're still having an end negative out outcome um, from the big picture perspective. So that's, yeah. uh, is that kind of what you're saying in a kind of a dumbed down way for the layman? Yeah. It, I, I mean, I think everyone will agree. Everyone will agree. There is a mutation rate that the human race cannot tolerate. Yeah. Th th there's going to be a limit. We can't tolerate too many. And, and that's actually connected to how much of the genome is functional. Um, because, uh, if it's functional, there are many ways. There are many more ways. There, there are many more ways to break something than to, to make something. And so, in general, uh, 
if it does have some purpose, uh, you know, some biological, in, in the sense, in the medical sense, not not uh, the sense of reproductive success, but in the medical sense, uh, it, if it has some function and it mutates, it's more likely to be bad, in, in or at least neutral. So maybe well, that's about the only that's the only thing we could probably come away with. There's a mutation rate that we can't tolerate. I, I will bring up the point uh, to not confuse functionality with sequence dependence necessarily. So you can have sections of the genome that are functional, like they, they serve some sort of purpose as, you know, a, a ribin or whatever those riboenzymes are. Um, or like introns, for instance, where a small fraction of them are sequence dependent, but they still serve an overall function within the genome and they might become transcribed because of that, right? So just because 82% of the genome is being transcribed, but we need 10% of it to be sequence dependent doesn't necessarily mean that those are contradictory. Although I do think 82% is high. I, it's probably about 20. Um, but you know, see, sequence dependence and functionality aren't necessarily, they're related, but not the same thing, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I understand. I think I understand where you're coming from because we can, as I said, you can, we, we can change the sequence a little bit and the genome will tolerate it. But um, at another ENCODE conference in 2015, not the one that I was a part of, there was one that was among the ENCODE planners. Uh, they're talking about robustness. Uh, it's just, again, just like that tire, you could scrape off a few pieces and it's you're not gonna notice the damage until it starts to accumulate. So as far as sequence dependence, um, so let's change, let's suppose we change, I'll give you a very specific example. I, I happen to know this repetitive sequence. It's a three kilobase repetitive sequence called D4Z4. It's in the, uh, it's associated with the dystrophin gene. So anyone can look it up. I'm sorry, I don't have the references off the top of my head, um, but it can be looked up. So in a normal human being, uh, they can have about 100 repeats of this three kilobase uh, D4, Z4 repeat, and just amazing. You can knock one out and you get down to 99, that human will be fine. You can knock another one and he's only down to 98 repeats. But if you get down to 12, it starts to be kind of not so good. By the time you get down to 11, if you've knocked out, um, so then 89 of them and now you have 11, that person will have muscular dystrophy. It took a lot of research to figure that out. So the question is, well, do we call that D4, Z4 repeat junk or not? Because obviously the human can tolerate those changes uh, in being knocked out. And this was the issue that Kondrashov brought up and also Ira Walker Keatley, is these are the sort of mutations where you can just keep knocking these out and it tolerates, the, the organism will tolerate those changes very well. You, you wouldn't notice it from a phenotypic st standpoint. But there's there's that threshold when it's crossed, it just goes, you know, it just goes really bad. It's just like, uh, again, that's the, <laughs> for lack of a better word, I don't know if I'm using it right. That's like the synergistic epistasis. This is like when you have a space shuttle that has five equal navigation systems, four of them knock out, get knocked out or broken. The space shuttles can still fly home. But you you knock out that last one, uh, the space shuttle's gone. It's not going to make it home. And so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of redundancy in the genome, and are we going to classify that as functional or, or not? And I would argue that um, in certain cases we might have to, uh, because it can't tolerate infinite change to it. You, you can change little pieces, but then it's going to add up, just like a tire going bald. So I mean, you raise an interesting question. Um, if I could just say, let, uh, I'm willing. Really let, let me make an interjection here, so because yeah. you know the the points like this, I hear this all the time on, uh, you know, redundancy and copies and duplicates and all these kind of things. But, but yet, it seems that every month or so, I come across a new paper that has discovered a usage for one of these types of scenarios. You know, oh, we found out that X Y Z insert. Uh, thing like you're talking about, you're, the one your example you're giving was for uh, uh, resulting muscular dystrophy, and then but other ones, you know, you talked about knocking out 89 of them when you get to 11. We're finding other ones like short tandem repeats that are five, six, seven, 
base pairs and, and repeats some, and sometimes even uh, you know, yeah. not that many, right? And now they're finding out that just a couple of those in relative, you know, basic point mutations are causing negatives. And this, this aren't even even being considered coding non, or, or regulatory. And they're finding out that, oh, whoa, this actually oh, has, yeah. ne this make, has negative yeah. impact on uh, uh, gene transcription and expression in general. And so the point I'm, I'm making with all this is from the evolutionary biology perspective, you're operating from the, pers from the angle that, hey, this mustn't have any use. But then we keep finding things that completely disprove that. So was at some point, does, is it going to take 100% of the genome being shown to be functional in order to change your mind? Or what point, where is the, where is the tipping point for you guys in terms of uh, changing your perspective on what's the more, uh, what's the more reasonable conclusion? And the, I would argue that the, evidence that we're seeing in spe specifically in medical research is rapidly uh, skewing things away from your perspective. And I mean, even in some of the, and Sal, I know you've read plenty of these papers too. So I mean, many of them on the medical side, they're literally stating this like, Hey, at what point are we going to stop acting like this is junk? I mean, there's, hey, they're, put, they're putting in their papers. Yeah. I'd like to acknowledge modern day debate is <laughs> joined us. Thanks. I just wanted to say, hey, thanks, yeah. James. Sure Every once in a while, James comes over and uh, you know graces us slowly, people with yeah, uh, thanks, man. Only a couple, uh, uh, not very many subscribers. We don't get the oh man, James. By the way, I the most I saw uh, live viewers hit for the Ray Comfort uh, Madelante. You were up over twenty one hundred at one point, man. Congratulations wow. on yeah uh, on that live stream. That was a that was a crusher, man. Yeah. So. Um, so I I just like to say I've been monitoring this question for like ever since genetic entropy came out. And at the time when genetic entropy came out, we didn't have the encode results. We didn't have 4D nucleome. We didn't have E4 epitranscriptome or uh any of the other things. So it's it's a different ball game because the, the reason they're studying this is they're trying to solve medical problems and they're seeing that these regions of, of DNA are implicated. So like in the case of the muscular dystrophy, that was a big break breakthrough when they found out that, hey, you know, it would have been easy to knock out so many of that, of those, tan, uh, of those uh, tandem repeats and there's no phenotypic consequences, but there's a limit. You can't keep knocking them out. Well, and, so and something, there's and like something a margin else, of safety there. And something else I'd like to interject to Sal that really annoys me about uh, when you hear like, oh, it didn't have, this didn't happen in mice or whatever. The there's also plenty of papers talking about how, hey guys, there's a dramatic difference between in vivo and in vitro in terms of what is actually being uh, used. And there's we're starting to discover that there's plenty of things we thought had no function that actually do while still inside of the organism and uh, are being used dynamically in very rare scenarios. So actually oh, are yeah. not sort of the non the knockout experiments aren't actually showing whether or not there was real function uh, exactly. in the real in the real application of the uh, portion of the genome versus in the lab. I mean, it's exactly. and I, I've seen more and more of those papers coming out about yeah. that, that realization. Now that they're being able to do more of the real world well, analysis, real time. I'll, analysis. Give you, I'll give you an example. Um, and we talked about this before. Uh, cardiomyocytes, these are cells inside um, our hearts. At some stage, they're, they're polyploid. There's, I don't know that there's any heart researcher that'll say that all the polyploid somatic cells in a human being there have no, have no use. I mean, there, there's, I, I, I doubt there's any researcher to, that, that'll say that those duplications are meaningless. They, they're implicated in stress response. So uh, it's exactly as you say uh, that uh, there there could be there could be function under stress where that's important. So when people talk about look at all the polyploidy in plants, I said, well, in our somatic lines, there's some cells that are polyploid too, and most researchers will, will not say that's an accident. Um, th they would be very concerned that if they didn't see the polyploidy in some of these cells, because that would be considered maybe. Uh, an abnormal condition. We don't know exactly why some of our somatic cells are polyploid. 
Um, and I'll mention, I, I typed in the uh, chat there, Brenda Andrews, ENCODE 2015. She did a lot of single knockout experiments on yeast. Okay, granted, that's not as complex as a human. She said, hey, look, it didn't have any. She said, look, at we had like, we could knock out individually. We took like half of the, something like half of the genes you could knock out and the yeast would be fine with just one knockout. But when she went to double knockouts, and started doing all the combinatorics, you know, you, you knock out this one and that one. Then it appeared that, um, oh, gee, those those genes are important. So there's a lot of knockouts that can happen that don't affect the phenotype. And this leads to something very interesting. A lot of the um, arguments against natural selection have been irreducible complexity, that's one. The one that's really bad, that's probably a worse problem, is if you have an irreducible complex system that is a backup system. We know we have, we've we had experiments and we've had simulations that show that backup systems are dispensed with. So anything that's involved in stress response, if like there's a starvation system, you know, a starvation scenario, guess what starts to go? <laughs> all that, all the metabolism that's set up to deal with uh, stress response. It's like if you're kind of poor, you don't buy insurance. If you're rich, you can afford it. And so uh, these all these contingency and backup things, they go first. Selection will get dispensed with them. And uh, so Brenda Andrews did these experiments and she's showing, she was showing a lot of things, a lot of genes that can be knocked out and just like that one gene in isolation, we, she couldn't detect the change in fitness. It was, it was a very interesting experiment because she had to use a robot because she's there's so many thousands of genes. She had to have the, the robot actually knock out one gene at a time and then knock them out in pairs and then triplets. And that's why they invited her to ENCODE 2015 because she was saying, well, you know, we can't use this. Um, we can't define function by using these genetic per perturbation studies because uh, because a single knockout may not reveal its purpose any more than like, you know, like that space shuttle example, you could knock out one and you'd think, oh, hey, that navigation system's useless. <laughs> so um, there's some real subtleties here. Uh, um, well, and I, I, and I, yeah. I think a huge portion of this in terms of the ready acceptance uh, inside of academia for a lot of things that you're we're talking about tonight not being uh, relevant or evidence evidentiary in terms of their research. Um, okay. If you're operating from the perspective that you're not dealing with a dynamic system, which we obviously are dealing with a dynamic system in every aspect of biology, the, uh, but if you're going to operate from the, from the mindset that that's not the, not reality, then obviously you're not going to recognize readily recognize the things that you're talking about and you and i've been discussing this last couple minutes in terms and you have all night of uh hey if it's a double knockout yeah obviously there's a whole bunch more variables that can result in this negative occur this the negative outcome the that you have to account for and what really blows my mind is when we start at the more recognizing that you know single point mutations can equal x disease a point mutation and then you're going to sit here and argue that no, these mutations aren't actually potentially negative. Well, I will say on the flip side, it, it seems to be very, uh, I mean, when more and more and more diseases are being recognized from literal single point mutations, I mean, at what point do you recognize that there is uh, extreme uh, requirement of uh, it's remaining strict without damage uh, just to fulfill the evolutionary model? Okay, I, I will say though, extrapolating a handful of point mutations resulting into diseases very clearly mean doesn't mean that all point mutations result in disease, right? We wouldn't be alive if all point mutations were deleterious because we have hundreds in every generation. Uh, they're not right, right, and, and, the, and right, and that's the whole point that I'm making is that we are seeing uh, more and more spikes in disease uh case in point uh in 1995 the it was one in 154 kids were born with autism fast forward to 2020 it's one in 50 or it's one in 49 
And guess what? We've also found we've discovered where the not all of the reasons, but quite a few of the reasons for autism are directly caused by point mutations in a variety of uh, coding regions. Yeah, and but, like, so the, yeah. but you've also heard correlation doesn't imply causation, right? Well, no, no, no. They're they're directly stating that this is the causation, not the correlation. No, the, the point mutations might be the causation, but the correlation is probably more due to better methods of um, recognizing these diseases, right? Now, um, I will say this: this is one reason Dr. Sanford. Hang on, hang on. You don't you don't think we could diagnose autism in 1995? No, we could. Of course okay. we could. So, okay, so to say that it's jumped uh, per the standards, and there's been plenty of papers on this and in terms of the acceleration rate of it, uh, you're trying to suggest that it going from 1 in 154 to 1 in 49 in 20 years is not a... You're saying that's just because we started to diagnose it better? I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I'm saying that's probably the large majority of the reasons. Okay. Uh, John, John, John I'm, uh, I want to thank both Walker, uh, Walking Fish, and you for hosting me. I have oh. to sign off in a little bit. Can you play that clip with Do Dr. Sanford, and we'll close with that? Yeah, let me see. Do you have it make that handy? Hang on. Uh, yeah, hang on. Walking sorry. Fish, I really thank you for joining and and for the reference you gave. I'd oh, like to course. also thank uh, Creation Myths for answer uh, posing questions, even ones I couldn't answer. Before we play that video, though, uh, can yeah. I just say one problem I had with the tiramisu model that might be extrapolated out to other people? Oh. If you could give a uh, special, special tribute to the SFP channel. channel. I'll need a commercial break and uh, I might have to sign off. So you could just play that, uh, John, and thank you all. All right. Take care. Is everyone still there? Are we still live streaming? No. Huh. <laughs> All right. Well, since I'm the only person live. Oh, okay. He's back. <laughs> I hit you with my computer there. Oh, you're um, good. You're good. I was just kind of confused for a second. I'm not, I'm not sure what's happening with my. It's not. It's my computers. I've had, I had to. My laptop went haywire yesterday, so I had to break out my old computer, and it's not uh, oh. responding well to what I'm trying to do here. The, uh, did uh, did Sal have to sign off? Uh, I think so. Okay. Right on. Well, everybody, thanks for uh, coming by. It was fun. I enjoyed listening to Sal's model. I hope uh, the... I find it very interesting that the, uh, and this kind of applies to you, uh, Walker, of the uh, you're talking looking at these models. I mean the the logic behind what Sal was showcasing wasn't really any different than the exact same type of models you see for um, in evolutionary biology. Uh, in reference to which ones? Like the ones he was directly citing, right? I'm sorry, both both in in those and in a general sense of well, with the same type of logic in population genetics, and one of the reasons I find it interesting the pushback, not just from you, but from other folks in chat and such. Yeah. Uh, I'm like when you read the papers on population genetics, they're presenting the exact same types of models, right? Now they're mm -hmm. the conclusions might be different, but the uh, but the models are very similar. And the, but when the data doesn't match up, 
or the conclusions don't match up with something that makes uh, neo Darwinism, you know, a viable conclusion. Suddenly, that whole premise is just going to be completely. Uh, oh wait, let's not even consider this. Uh, it must be wrong. Yeah. The it's like, well, hang on. <laughs> What's good for the goose should be good for the gander. Come on now. Yeah, well, one of the problems I wanted to bring up to Sal, which unfortunately had to go, but I, I had a list of notes. It's all right. Um, the only model that he actually brought up that had to do with diploid like populations uh, was his sixth source, which only included random mating, no selective pressures, and a small starting population size, right? So that's just basically inbreeding, which, yeah, of course, that accumulates deleterious mutations. That's the whole reason inbreeding is bad and you can't marry your cousin. Um but the most of the rest of his sources, from what I saw, and there's a couple of them that I haven't read. I'm, I pulled them up, and I'm going to read them probably tomorrow because I still have about four hours of physics homework. Um, but m most of his uh, most of his models exclusively dealt with you know haploid asexual populations, uh, pretty much anything that you know Mueller's ratchet dealt with in the first place. Uh, like, well, for example, his tiramisu model that he he used. Um, it, it seemed very similar to Mueller's ratchet. You had one single set of information that was being passed on, and that's how the deleterious mutations were being fixed into the population. You know, you didn't have two sets to restore the wild type if the mutations were deleterious to the point of uh, an affecting fitness, right? I mean, but I would say that if you're going to follow that logic, then A, how does any mutation get through? Because if it has no function then theoretically it should be uh, removed and then but more importantly we do see del uh, uh, negative mutations get through uh in sexual selection oh, every, com yeah. every, every every combination so that is an excuse to circumvent the argument being made isn't valid because we directly do see those uh yeah. I'm getting not saying deleterious mutations don't happen they obviously do. getting through reproduction so, so the so the point is, when you start to look at the, uh, I think the point that Sal was making all night was, okay, if we readily accept that this is how many are getting through, no way, and like that's what the data is, you know, agreed upon, right? If those, that is how many are getting through, then in order for us to be overcoming this, because uh, this is already this is past the recombination stage, right, where they're getting through. So to be overcoming this, we would have to have this level of reproduction through in, in order to ac account for it. And I think that's the entire point that I was making. And you know, you've already gone past, you're not just relying on asexual, you're past that uh, and your past recombination, which is being obviously is oftentimes used as a supposed workaround. That's the point I'm making is yeah. in this context, you're already past, we're looking at the real world data, not hypothetical data of, hey, here's how many are getting through based on our own research. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. And like I said, that was one of the problems I guess I was having, right? It, there's no way the deleterious mutation rate could be that high because we have a sustainable population. It would crash after two or three generations if we had such a high functional fraction of the genome and such a high mutation rate, or a deleterious mutation rate specifically. Well, I mean, what do you, what do you mean? We're, it's accepted that we have, what, the 82 to 100 uh, mutation, mutations Per yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's accepted. Pretty well accepted. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. By, by his math, that was, you know, you would have to have 10 to the 35th offspring to be, uh, to maintain a viable population. From a, not, it's to, I think you, I think you may have missed the point. He wasn't saying that if you don't have that level that the species immediately goes, uh, becomes distinct or extinct. It's that the genetic decay is the only logical outcome. And obviously the, and over time, you're going to reach a level where the uh, uh, combination of the mutations over the generations will reach a point where you have massive negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. The point I was making in context of um, autism, like we've now determined not the all of the variables, but quite a few of the causes of autism being directly tied to different uh, regulatory portions of the genome, right? So mm -hmm. the, and we're now seeing a increase in the number oh, of people with exactly. that, uh, with those mutations. And it's like, okay, so obviously to your point of the, uh, as it's coming through in various generations, as we're getting in, uh, 
creation myth was talking about this earlier of, uh, oh, we've got 7 billion people, so all this stuff should be happening. It's like, well, true. Um, we should be start having some negative uh, outcomes, which hmm, coincidentally, we're starting to have a whole bunch more genetic disorders being uh, coming prevalent. But when you actually do some basic history, uh, 150 years ago, there was only a billion people on this planet. So, and it was a relatively low uh, global population. Uh, so all of these potential variables, there weren't the sheer numbers to account for them. Sorry, so welcome back, man. Hello. I have a uh, quote from Michael Lynch, who's probably one of the most respected evolutionary biologists uh, right up there with Joe Felsenstein. Let me see if I could find it. Michael Lynch, uh, mutation and human exceptionalism, our future genetic load. Uh, can I share my screen? Oh, would that, is that all right with you, uh, John? Yeah. Oh, were you able to show the uh, Dr. Sanford video? No, my, my, I'm having to run on my old computer right now. It wasn't letting me. Uh, okay. It was going. It was going haywire. So, mutation and human exceptionalism. Uh, this is a recent article. I'm sorry, I don't have the date. It remains difficult to escape the conclusion that numerous physical and psychological attributes are likely to slowly deteriorate in technologically advanced societies. The incidence of a variety of afflictions, including autism, male infertility, asthma, immune system disorders, diabetes, etc., already exhibit increases exceeding the expected rate. This observational work may substantially underestimate the mutational vulnerability of the world's most complex organ, the human brain, because because, uh, because human brain function is governed by the expression of thousands of genes, the germline mutation rate to uh, psychological disorders may be unusually high. At least 30% of in individuals with autism spectrum disorders appear to acquire behaviors by de novo mutation. It has been suggested that there has been a slow decline in intelligence in the United States and the United Kingdom over the past century. So now the question is, people will say, oh, hey, well, maybe it's because of the technological, you know, we have modern medicine. But I'm going to point out again, if you look at that E to the U, that U paradox, if we just add one or two mutations, okay, just going from one to three mutations, if we have one mutation, uh, you know, we need 5.4 offspring. You go to just three. That's just adding two more mutations per generation per individual. You need suddenly 40. That's almost like a factor of eight. There's not much room, if you get what I mean, uh, that if we're misestimating the mutation rate, if we're just off by one or two mutations, that's going to make a difference between going from 40 to five. Yeah. So the question is, uh, and this is uh, this is the question that uh, – Kondrashov raised. He said, you know, let's even, excluding modern technology, why aren't we dead 100 times over by now? So um, we don't know whether this was on account of modern technology that we're not eliminating all these individuals. We may, that may have helped, which is kind of sad. I mean, that's kind of sad. So many people had to be eliminated by natural selection, but we don't know if this trend has, has been in place for a while. So, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not trying to be polemic here, but when I see when I've studied this issue, I said, you know, I think Dr. Sanford has has a very legitimate concern and a case, and it's because of people like mm -hmm. Michael Lynch and all these other. I, I could cite so many other geneticists. I haven't found one of that level of reputation that thinks we're improving. There's no one that I don't know anyone that thinks we're improving genetically. Yeah. Well, once again, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I haven't read the article that Michael Lynch is quoting from, but the selective pressures in our current population are much, much weaker than they have been for the majority of human history. And I think we'd all agree on that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if we are seeing a spike in de novo mutations that are causing, you know, having negative outcomes, that's another very plausible explanation for that, right? 
it, it, it's possible, but unless we know the mutation rate, because again, what if we're killing off, um, I, I mean, what if the, the, the birth rate went from, I mean, the uh, survival rate, um, or, or let's say the number of children per couple, Okay, let's just go by children per couple. Let's say it's uh, what uh, two point three in the USA. Let's say it was ten before. Um, it, it, if the mutation rate was just one or two more per generation, even with um, uh, even with having ten kids per couple, that would still be too low. So it, yeah. I would say it's plausible only if, but but it, it would be by a, a fra by a by a thread it, it'd be by a thread because you know we're, we're we're talking about you know maybe between say less than one mutation to maybe three mutations per, per individual per generation if we're up to 10 um the most that this could have done uh is is slow it down i i, I mean the, the harsh environments of the past and it's only accelerating now but it was a trend that was long in play so I mean, just from a personal standpoint, this isn't necessarily scientific. That's that's why I don't believe that humans ev evolved. I don't think we could have tolerated the load because because our brains are so complex and they're very very sensitive to uh, uh, certain point mutations more so than creatures that have actually the same in the same genes that uh, we share. Um, and oh, by the way, I have experimental evidence, small experimental evidence of that. Um, so, uh, I mean, you bring up a good point, you know, we, we have to factor out the effect of modern medicine, but I mean, just, I'm just saying personally, one reason I'm a creationist is the, the numbers just don't, the numbers look too formidable for me, uh, to, to, to believe we could have evolved. Yeah. That, that's right. fair. I well, think well, I, I would and, have and that's, before, and that's before you even really contemplate, I mean, like, uh, Stern is currently going off on his tangents about math, and the uh, the you know we've been talking about math all night. But what really cracks me up in the context of a lot of these debates, discussions, arguments, uh, is people like to break all this down to pure oh well it's math and hey we were able to come up with a model that can explain how we can circumvent common sense and basic. Uh, logic and when you and basic observations and when you really go and look at the you know on the molecular level all the way through up to the system the variety of the systems that enable life to exist and you really look at it from both the micro and the macro level it is I mean the level of engineering systems engineering that, that is required it's like cool you made up a formula that says this is how all of the data requirement could come into existence. Cool. I literally dare you to make that same argument about anything else. If that's a remote, pl uh, remotely plausible uh, conclusion to be reaching. And it's why it's one of the reasons I get so entertained by uh, phylogeny. When you really look at the, uh, the assumptions that are required for those uh, models. And it's like, oh wow, there's well, there's no like massive assumptions being required in order to make uh, the results fit your model. Okay, no, there, there, no, no, uh, no crazy starting point uh, that's going to make this almost guaranteed to come out in in your favor. Uh, anyway, enough of my little sidebar tangent there, but that stuff just when you really start to look at what is actually being argued to have happened through natural. <laughs> Undirected mutation and natural selection, uh, it starts to get pretty, uh, pretty entertaining for me uh, to actually see, listen to people say that with a straight face. Yeah. Well, well Walker, do, do you go by the name Walker or do I call you Walking Fish? Which, I don't know. Uh, yeah, just call me Walker. So, <laughs> oh, Walker, thank you. Are, are you a student of uh, evolutionary biology? I am. Yep, I'm a bio major. Um, I'm on the evolutionary biology track, and I'm thinking about all, like, sort of sub, further sub specializing into like. Uh, genomics, bioinformatics, evolutionary genetics, that kind of stuff. But okay. I'm still fairly early into this. So, so have you done? Um, well, 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 all the more reason I'm extremely grateful that you joined us this evening, since you're a student and 
Um, I try to relate well to students. Um, oh, you're great. <laughs> and do you uh, do you have you started studying phylogenetic methods uh, with like say um, using um, uh, with multiple sequence alignments and then uh, you know doing like um, maximum parsimony or anything like that? Have you gotten to that point yet? In classes and in school, no. Um, I've looked a bit into it, like in my own personal time, just because that, like I said, that's kind of what I'm interested in. Um, although, if you are looking for like a uh, bioinformatics type of person, I'm pretty sure Jackson Wheat would love to take you up on that conversation. Uh, actually, no, because I'm I'm trying to re actually it's actually for a different reason. I was asking. Okay. Um, uh, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to. I actually did study a little bit of evolutionary biology in, in biological, in in bio grad school. Like I said, my my professor of bioinformatics he uh, he actually worked for a top evolutionary biologist uh, at the NIH, and uh, so I learned a few um, phylogenetic methods, mm -hmm. and um, I'd like you know, one class really isn't enough, and I just wanted to meet someone that does statistical phylogeny. Because, uh, ironically, creationists are actually also really interested in it because of the question of Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark. So, um, th this is kind of a funny situation where some creationists will criticize phylogenetic methods, but then they also have to use them <laughs> in certain <laughs> contexts. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. A, I'm just. I wasn't asking. It's. It's not totally a hostile relationship. Um, there are elements of evolutionary biology that um, creationists, especially the phylogenetic methods that are of interest to us. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've wanted to do it with bacteria, a little bit with viruses and in, in, in some creatures. So uh, they actually go at phylogenetic methods from a, a different angle. They believe the model is an orchard model, not a universal tree. That's, that's just the major difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, of course, like phylogenomic methods are going to be necessary if you believe in any kind of speciation at all, right? You know. So anyway, that's that, that was just a side. I just uh, oh yeah, more or less a question just to get to know you better. So oh, thanks. Yeah. Um. So I, I, I um, you know, this is always a tough situation because uh, I I do uh, appreciate students, but then there are certain disciplines I. You know, because I'm a creationist, that you know, there there will be a line where we can't agree. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I'm excited to learn more. Honestly, one of the biggest reasons I started this channel is just to to understand, like, I guess the other side of the debate a little bit better. Also, I think it's it's fun and interesting. You know what I mean? Yes. Did you have any? Was um, what I presented tonight? I, I hope that was educational and informative. I mean, I'm not saying you have to agree with everything I said, but I, I hope at least gave you a little bit more than what you had before you came. Yeah, for sure. You know, I have at least uh, three more sources I need to read before <laughs> anytime I have another conversation. So that's yeah. always a good thing. Yeah. Um, John, maybe we could have another lecture sometime. I might be able to get Professor DeWeese to come once. Oh, awesome. Uh, I told you I'm making presentations to faculty tomorrow and uh, deans. Um, it's been in, uh, this is interesting development in Christian colleges. There's a fight over creationism in Christian colleges um, because there are a lot of theistic evolutionists in Christian colleges. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel Jensen and I, uh, I, I've related this. We were presenting at Joe's College and man, some of the faculty there in the Church of Christ uh, college system, which includes several colleges like Pepperdine, Fried Hardeman, Harding, um, Lubbock, um, Oklahoma, so many universities. Some of the biology faculty were really hostile and just like, I wasn't even talking about creationism, but they just knew I was associated with John Stanford. They were so mean to us, but uh, it's kind of softened now because some of the creationists have really taken a stand and some of them are in the biology faculty that are creationists in biochemistry. Joe DeWeese is one of them. Maybe we could have him on someday. He's one of the guys at Lipscomb just 30 minutes away from you. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, about I, research. Um, absolutely, I, I would, I would love to do that. That'd be, a, that'd be a lot of fun. Be, uh, be, be a great conversation. And to your point on the, 
uh, you know, people making the starting to draw the line in the sand, if you will, is at this point, the, the evidence and the, for example, uh, sound, you've probably read the, read some papers on this stuff, but the whole like discovery of the, uh, starting to discover the, what appears to be nervous system like circuits in the ribosomes. I mean, familiar with that. Wow. Uh, the, yeah, I was reading a paper. It's from, it's from this year. Uh, I was reading on the nervous system, cir uh, nervous system circuits discovered in ribosome, I think was the head of the title of the paper. Oh, and, I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there reading through it and they're talking about like, basically how is this, is this showcasing? Is this, uh, getting more in depth into how the ribosome is being able to have some of the additional control factors and uh, things that are going yeah. on, hey, which didn't there surprise, didn't surprise me in the slightest that this is what they were discovering because I figured like this is the logical conclusion, right? Based on what we see occurring. But the very interesting portion of it for me, one of the most interesting pieces was uh, basically discussing how, hmm, this makes it appear that we can no longer view the ribosome as a purely mechanistic uh, machine. Yeah. And I was like, well, that would, that's interesting, number one. But uh, obviously, number two, when you think about that from the abiogenesis perspective, you're coming to a whole new level of incredulity. And I mean, it, what I find entertaining in the debates that I have on uh, abiogenesis, for example, people always argue that I'm making arguments of incredulity. And I'm like, no, it's an argument of sanity. At some point, you have to, uh, decide whether or not any of this is plausible or not. And when, when things were starting to discover, it's like, come on, man. Are you kidding me? Sorry, so go ahead. Um, I don't know that I can type in live comments. Uh, through, I, can I type it in the private chat? The, uh, no, no, at the link, top. link to your paper. And if you could put, I, I have to put it in my other computer, which isn't quite as slick. That's how I was able to interact with the audience. By the way, I want to thank all the audience that have come out to hear us live and all those that will see us uh, oh. recorded. So if you could, so that was the article, the nervous circuits in the ribosome. That's news to me. That's pretty exciting. Oh, you, oh, you were asking me to publish that in the, uh, let me, okay, I'll put that in the chat. Can, can you put it in uh, the uh, regular chat for everyone to see? Yeah. Because when yeah, he said that, I said, oh man, you gotta be kidding. Oh, and you know what? This will really get under someone's skin that you and I know. They use the word machine. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that well, you know, it's it interesting. The other day, Sal, I actually had an interaction with a guy on, uh, uh, we were talking about some of the aspects of abiogenesis. And the he was trying to make the argument that the HeLa case could just not be quite as efficient as needed, as necessary. And still work, and I'm like, I'm no, no. I, I think I know. It is, I know. A well, it, it, it is a well established premise that the Hela case can't just be going in a crappy version. Like this isn't no. And then, but the irony, the piece that got me more than anything was he was making the argument that, and by the way, this guy's claiming to be in a origin of life researcher. Okay, he claimed to be this. The uh, he was trying to argue that the Hela case could somehow come into existence prior to DNA and RNA, and I'm like, what? How? Why? how like the, the, well it was time it was incrementally over time like for how what's the what's the selective pressure what is the pressures that you guys all rely upon that made a hela case come into existence i mean I, I i don't understand how you can view this as a remotely plausible uh conclusion while simultaneously telling me that you are i don't know what i'm talking about and you're an origin of life research and th those kinds of things don't even uh make any sense to me uh, from just even from the chemistry perspective, yeah. let alone the big picture perspective. So there, there is one guy, CRISPR Cas9 in your debate with Erica, he said, uh, you know, there's only 50% conservation. So it can, you know, can it tolerate 50% changes? And I was just like, well, it certainly couldn't tolerate 50% deletions because it's, it's going to alter the, the physical shape or, Conversely, lots of random insertions. This would be really bad. He might have been talking about point mutations, which it may be able to. Uh, it, it's a little bit difficult to get into the theory of this, but it, it 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 can mutate. But you might have to mutate other parts simultaneously to get it to work. 
uh, we have confirmation of this. It, it's it's actually some structural biology I'm studying right now where we're tying bioinformatics. We find out that when, like say the helicase in one organism is different than another, uh, the, the, the changes are not random. They have to occur simultaneously for it to work. And that, that's gonna cause a problem. Oh, let's see, someone wrote me, Nicholas Whitmire, uh, just a walking, uh, said, thank you all for sharing your perspectives and expertise. So, <laughs> Thank you. I don't have much expertise, but uh, I appreciate the thought. <laughs> but but I just wanted to say, um, proteins can tolerate some amount of change. We don't, you know, we don't actually have a have a figure. But let's say that that CRISPR Cas guy in your debate with Erica, he said fifty percent. So you you have that means then you have a thousand amino acids in a helicase or so. Fifty percent have to be. Right. That's still a lot. That's still 500. That's still 500 you need to get right. I mean, what are the odds that you can get 500 right? And that's why I love sh showing structural diagrams because you could actually see why it's not going to work if you cut out too much. It has to be the right size. So I was, I was just looking at some helicases right here, see if I could show one with a, a quaternary structure. But it's so obvious uh, that uh, you know, it's just like a nut and bolt. You could see you can't really change it. it there's pretty much an optimal configuration. Otherwise, it's just not going to work out oh, here. Uh, can I show you the helicase? Because we talked about it. It's on us oh, yeah. here because uh, it's such a beautiful. It's uh, And I'll show you another enzyme. I'll show you the enzyme I'm working on, too. That's a helicase. And each is... Uh, the. Uh, this is a homohexameric helicase. So there's some helicases that don't have six units. You can see they're six colors. That's why I say six and hexa. Each of these colored regions is a protein, really the formal term is polypeptide. And all of them are se sequence identical to each other and they connect. But you could see if I just started deleting pieces, like say from one here, it's no longer going to connect to its neighbor. I mean, that's just a part of the problem. In the geometry problem, it has to form this little donut hole that has to be the right size. The DNA goes right between that in that donut hole. Have your uh, positions for ATP, right? To actually cause the rotation uh, The ATP is right here. The, the ATP regions, the ATP loads right in this region. It's slightly discolored. And I just know from other diagrams that it's right in that region. So the ATP will load here and it loads in two spots uh, two or four of the spots, I don't remember. And then in two of them, they're empty. And so when it rotates, uh, the ATP will get converted to ADP and it'll dump it and then it'll become empty and then it gets loaded. And uh, if we can ever figure out how to do StreamYard and I can play videos, it's just a really cool video that shows the ATP um, working with a helicase. And I'm just like, yeah, uh, as far as I know, you're not going to get a cell without this baby. And it's even more complex than that because how does this thing get on the DNA? You know, you have to get the DNA to go uh, to, to thread the needle. They have to have a, a ring, a helicase loader. So it actually assembles this helicase machine around. I love that word, John, machine. machine. <laughs> I'll keep saying because I know it's going to get under someone's skin. Well, well yeah. that's why when you when you think <laughs> when you think about the transcription complex and all the pieces that come in to your point of, you know, the assembly process that's happening in to construct the helicase around the DNA to start and then you know there's obviously I think there's what like seven or eight different additional components, major components um, that are needed to even kick start the transcription process. Yeah. And I mean when you when you kind of think when you start to think about those um, elements of real world application folks not theory not oh hey if this and this and this and this and this and this happened then oh and we get it, we tried enough times then this could happen uh you have to think you have to really start to put this into you know real world application and part of the thing that really cracks me up is and this goes back to the abiogenesis uh component is okay synthetic biologist or sorry, uh, synthetic chemist 
go recreate a helicase from scratch with nothing but amino acids. Go. Can totally, yeah. totally controlled environment in your lab, no pollutants. You go recreate a helicase in your lab. You know the exact sequence. You know the exact formula. You know, you know the whole process. You get to watch it in real time in your lab, all be constructed. I literally dare you to go do it. And what are they going to say? Oh, I, I can't. Why? I thought this was just simple uh, amino acids coming together. There's nothing special. You, you can't do it. Why? I mean, it's a uh, to me when you really start to put these things into context of no, no, no. You don't get all of the enzymes that are, are in a cell that make all this stuff work. No, you don't get a ribosome to work with. No, you don't get. And you start you start to list off all the things you don't get. No, no, no. You get amino acids, buddy. That's it. And, suddenly, their suddenly yeah. their confidence vanishes in yeah. that hyper uh, hyper aggressive you don't know what the heck you're talking about you're an idiot this is totally doable we've watched this evolve in the lab really really we'll stern. We, we've watched a helicase evolve in the lab, in the lab. Stern. really stern you we have okay bro please show me that because well, whoever pulled that off better be famous as hell because i know they ain't done that okay i'll give you i'll give you one that's really interesting so this is a homohexameric so each of these are identical, right? And they're a thousand amino acids long. This is like taking a, a deck of cards and shuffling it and dealing them out. Six times you get the same sequence of cards. And that's only 52 cards. You have to do this 1,000 times, 1,000. This is like a 1,000 cards. You're going to shuffle them. And you want to get, get the same sequence of cards dealt out of the shoe. Uh, Six thousand like blackjack. You, you see the problem time. six yeah. times to get a, you want to get a, uh, that's what you'd have to do to build a helicase like this, a hexameric, homohexameric helicase. Yeah, and, and so, what, what really gets me is, I'll let you talk here in a second, Walker. What really gets me about the whole conversation from the abiogenesis perspective is the, when you really start to think about the, argument oh well it was just it's like rolling dice or you know we, oh we had to flip the coin yeah it wouldn't be normal if we flipped it but it, if enough times it could totally happen a thousand times in a row it's like yeah but you have 20 different coins that all have to be perfect at the same time in your linear extrapolation it's not you have to roll a thousand dice in a row but each one of them has to be a different number one out of 20 and oh. When you, when you really start to think, apply that logic to it, not just, oh, I'm flipping a coin. No, no, no. You have to roll dice that have one to 20 on them. And you have to roll, the first one has to be a one, the second one's a 10, the second one's a 14, then a two, then a 20, then a 19, then a 16, then a seven, then an eight, nine, then a one. I mean, all the way out a thousand times in a row. And if you fail, you're screwed. I mean, it's, you got to start back over again. I mean, people don't think about that from the actual... Uh, like real world application of what we're talking about here. Uh, I got a question for Walker. Have you had biochemistry yet? I have not. Um, yeah, the reason I haven't been saying anything is topics like abiogenesis are way outside my wheelhouse, and I don't really have an opinion on them. Um, okay. Well, well, the reason I asked you about biochemistry, I'm going to give you a little bit of biochemistry because this is the enzyme I'm studying. This is the topoisomerase too, and I study it with uh, Dr. Deweese. Uh, he's a professor of biochemistry. Uh, uh, he has a dual appointment, both at Vanderbilt School of Medicine and also Lipscomb. And uh, so he and I work on this particular enzyme. So, uh, so, so that's why I asked. So I, I'm just going to um, tell the audience about this one. This is, uh, this is a topoisomerase enzyme. And the way it works is it actually needs to have two copies of uh, the same protein or polypeptide, and then the two copies join. So we have just, you could say that we have the red copy and then the blue copy, and they're identical sequence-wise. And uh, so what this does is, I, boy, I know I'm going to, I'm embarrassed, I'm going to embarrass myself here. Um, th this acts like a, a pair of scissors, mm -hmm. and I think the DNA goes right through here and it's going to cut the DNA, uh, and then um, uh, unwind it a little bit, and then 
uh, join the two pieces of the DNA together that were cut. So I don't know if I have a diagram of how it does it. Um, but what I wanted to tell, oh yeah, here, here are some diagrams, how the topoisomerase, let me save this, this one. John, are you still there? No? Yep, yeah, I'm here. So this is a very easy probability. The topoisomerase is about 1,400 amino acids. What are the chances you could roll, uh, you could roll dice and, uh, 1,400 times and then roll it again and get the exact same sequence? <laughs> All right, so to get a topoisomerase like this, you have to roll the dice to get the left half. You have to roll the dice to get the right half. It's preferable that it's identical. And by the way, they have to be in the same geographic position, otherwise it's not gonna work. All right, so I'm trying to show you some of the probabilities here. Um, also, and you also have to think about it from the perspective of the, that the execute the expression of this is a on-demand. It's not a random uh, occurrence. This is being executed and synthesized on the on de on demand in a controlled fashion. Hey, someone said this enzyme looks super patriotic. Hey, I like that. <laughs> never, never occurred to me. Big fan. No, uh, yeah. What I've been trying to say, I, I don't mean to be a party pooper or anything, but it's getting kind of late, and I probably hey, need to be heading out. Uh, are you in school right now? By the way, I'm, I'm not at school. I'm taking summer classes right now. Oh yeah, your your studies come first, and I really, really, really want to thank you for joining us. Yeah, I really no, I had a great time. Yeah, me too. And and thanks for making the show. I don't think it'd have been the same if you didn't join yeah. us. So thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, it's been it's been great talking to you, Sal, and it's been nice meeting you as well, John. So uh, with Hope that, I think I'll be talking Same to me, you man. Go have fun uh, studying that physics, man. We'll see about Take that. Care. But yeah, bye guys. Have a good one. So uh, let me see if I could find this. Uh, well, well, the reason, you know, maybe we'll have another discussion, especially if, if we can get Joe to come, since he's uh, uh, he studied this enzyme for 15 years, and he's a nationally recognized expert on this particular enzyme. The reason it's of interest is it's a, it's a target for chemotherapies and cancer. So that's how creationists are able to get involved in research. Um, they, they can't criticize evolutionary theory, but if they could do things that um, help in the medical field, they'll get published. And so that's so just, how Joe was able so to- just, So you just go you do uh, medical research and uh, figure out ways to fix stuff and how, how it actually works rather than how you uh, want to hypothesize that it works, huh? <laughs> yeah, you'll get a job and, and they won't, ex I mean, Joe, Joe DeWeese is in is Genesis History, the lecture series, the extended parts. He's an open young earth creationist, but he's very he's a very good enzymologist and biochemist. So um, he, uh, he he's he, he's able to prosper dis, despite the obvious hostility even in his own university, because um, God's gifted him to be excellent biochemist, and they need biochemists to be able to solve medical problems. So it's like, well, you're a creationist. Hey, if you solve, if you help us cure cancer, you still have, you're still employed. You know, what are they, you know, they can't afford to fire someone like that. So his thing is the topoisomerase, which is the target of therapies. And um, uh, that's why we could, I, I'm a little more familiar when we talk about the protein probabilities. So that's why I was just laughing. It's like, okay, so in an origin of life scenario, how do you have how do you have a topoisomerase enzyme that's made of two identical pieces? So I mean, you could speculate you have one that's just made of one piece, but I mean, on what basis is that? All right, I, I mean, you're still going to run into you're still going to have to have something that's well. Why do we have scissors that are symmetric? For example, there's a structural reason you want symmetry, right? If you have a pair of scissors, right there. There's some symmetry there. It's the same with the topoisomerase. So here we have a, a DNA here. You see this? Oh yeah. And the, the, the DNA goes here and it's gonna chop it. Click. 
and then it has to uh, put it all back together. Uh, well, I don't and know that's one of the things that really gets me in, you know, the whole, uh, like the whole splicing, gene splicing uh, component, which, I mean, that's a very, that's an extraordinarily common function that's going on, like splicing of genes. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, hello, it's called mature. <laughs> It's the process, part of the process of mature, maturing a uh, mRNA. Like, hello, people. Right. And right. it's like, do you guys not think about this? for Like, let's think about this for a second. Number one, we have proteins that come in, literally chop out introns, and then put it back together and chemically bond it back in the correct order. Yeah. What what happens which, if which, which, equal, which equals the sequence for the protein? Like, yeah. let's, let's think about this for one second, folks. You cut it up, put it all back together, chemically weld every, the correct order, and then either the introns get you know uh, recycled, or sometimes they actually the intron itself becomes an mRNA to do an additional modification. That's a sidebar. The but when you think about that, of you know the whole oh it's just deterministic chemistry. Really? How? What is deterministic about a protein that comes in and cle does cleavage, literal uh, uh, scissoring of por portions out and then puts it in the correct order. What determines the correct order? Because as far as I know, chemically, nothing uh, determines the correct order of uh, the sequence. Unless I'm way off base on that one. But as far as I know, there's no nothing well, chemically I, I, I that would, uh, makes use, it happen. I would use different verbiage. It's like... Um, it's like a computer. Uh, we hope that it's deterministic, but there, there's nothing in nature that says that a computer has to self-assemble out of nothing. And and for a lot of the origin of life things, uh, that's pretty much what has to happen. And um, can I finish with the topo isomerase? Because I yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah go ahead. Okay, see so yeah, this this red thing is the is DNA here. And when it says cleavage, it cuts it, but then it has to put it back together. And the same thing with the a similar thing with the introns is it cuts things and puts it back together. What happens if you just have a system that just does the cutting? So you've, you, you evolve the cutter. What if you don't have something that stitches things back together? You've got a problem. What Joe DeWeese said is uh, if it didn't put it together, your topo isomerase is basically going to shred your genome. Right. <laughs> it's not putting it back together. It's just going to cut, cut, cut. And so, well, you know, uh, so much, so much for selection. If the if the creature's dead, you know, you're not going to have a second chance. So no, no, you're not. And it's 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 those types of pieces of the puzzle in terms of like what is actually required for life to exist, you know. And the, uh, you know, for me when. <laughs> When you think about this, especially in this slightly slight sidebar, but in the context of, you know, oh, well, we would just had horizontal gene transfer and all these different kind of things. And I'm like, yeah, well, cool. But we found that finding out that horizontal gene transfer doesn't really work outside of prokaryotes and some bacterias. I mean, maybe the, uh, but wait, there's all this, uh, methylation markers that block yes. that transfer from happening and like one of the, the the venter experiment that they go off on their tangents about about like oh we synthesize a cell it's like really they had to delete and restructure uh all sorts of components otherwise it would have been the horizontal gene transfer they were trying to accomplish would have failed oh it did fail until they figured out how to make that modification and i'm like okay so you guys had to go in and make a very hyper targeted modification in order for this to work that is not remotely naturally occurring and then we're going to be told that this is a example of you know proto cells and uh you know new synthetic life i'm like what <laughs> you, you had to undo the security features of that literally block what you're trying to accomplish to, uh, to pull off you had to hack it to make it work and you're going to, now you're arguing that this is a natural process after you just got done hacking. Like, come on. What other context would this be considered a, like a, even a, a plausible argument at all, but let alone something you would say with a straight face of, 
oh, well, this is how it just exactly what this is a totally reasonable conclusion of exactly how this happened. Like, w really? Name one other scenario where that would be a reasonable conclusion. Hey, um, I think I need to sign off. Um, yeah, we need to wrap up. It's getting late. I got to get up pretty early myself. I mean, so, I appreciate you uh, you coming yeah, on. Yes, we'll do some more. Uh, do some more of these soon. We got hey everybody. So uh, in the near future, yeah. uh, Sal and I are going to be doing a couple different shows. One of which is going to be an analyzing a few things, and we're going to issue some cow pie awards for a few of the things that we think are the dumbest assertions <laughs> being made that yeah. have the least plausibility of uh actual uh expect or re reasonable expectation of being yeah. the cow right pie. conclusion yeah so yeah. We, we, tr we try to be family friendly here you know what we really want to call it but uh, <laughs> we'll call it cow pies so yeah so. thanks everybody for uh, coming by and uh, make sure you go check out sal's ch uh, channel and his website and sal give us a, a little uh little plug on where they can go find out more about you and your website and your channel um, we have, I have one main site right now, evidenceandreasons.org, www.evidenceandreasons.org. Uh, it's not built up. It's under construction, but uh, um, I'm going to be putting stuff there. I will have a corresponding YouTube channel there. And uh, uh, I'd really want to, I really want to thank uh, the Standing for Truth channel, uh, Modern Day Debate, and John Maddox for helping promote um, my work. Uh, in the space of maybe two months, they brought me total, out of total obscurity to the public eye. And that's that's been really great because uh, the, the last six years have been spent just uh, kind of in the in research mode and study mode. And uh, so now I've been put on the stage here. And uh, so that video that we were trying to show, hopefully we'll get around to doing it sometime. Uh, Dr. Sanford is basically introducing me to the rest of the world as a uh, as, as uh, someone that has worked with him and uh, some of the exciting things we're hoping to do. So I'd really like to thank all of you for all your support and please pray for all of us and our health. Uh, Dr. Sanford is, is uh, fighting a heart and lung condition and uh, we're, we're praying he lives long. And uh, so lift him up before the Lord. It says, it says, let me see if I have the right let me, uh, if you if you will indulge me here, I want to make sure I get the right Bible verse. Uh, um, yeah, and then we'll 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 sign off. Okay, Second Corinthians. On a, Close with a Bible verse and no, I have the wrong one. Well, anyway, the <laughs> I'll find it. I need to find that verse. The Apostle Paul said that to, to, uh, he was saying. He was asking people to pray for him. So if even if an apostle of God needs prayer, uh, how much more all of us and all of us who work in creation science. So I'm asking prayers on behalf of Dr. Sanford for his heart condition and his lungs. And um, may he live a long life. There are a lot of people that absolutely love him, both friends and family and the creation, um, uh, the, the uh, creationists at large and really all have meant much of Christendom. So just wanted to thank you all for all your support and uh, take care and have a good night and have a blessed day. Mute there. Thanks so much, uh, Sal, for coming on, man. The uh, and everybody in the audience appreciate y'all coming. Your great questions, interactions, uh, and supporting uh, logical, plausible, probable. Make sure you go and check out Sal's website, his channels, uh, subscribe. He's got a bunch of stuff coming out uh, this Sunday. Uh, myself and SFT, uh, at least theoretically, right now, it's tentatively scheduled, but it's been canceled twice by our opponents. Uh, we're going to be taking on Fight the Flat Earth and Team Skeptic on a creation versus evolution uh, debate over on modern day debate i think it's uh i think it's currently scheduled for three or 3 p.m central 4 p.m eastern uh this sunday who knows it got canceled an hour before uh 
the last time it was scheduled. They keep having emergencies. Um, but uh, we'll see how that will happen. And then uh, well, I've got a couple more debates coming up in the next uh, week or so. But uh, yeah, thanks for everything y'all do. And as you guys, as I like to say, are considering the aspects and the reasons and the components of our existence, make sure that the conclusions you reach are always logical, plausible, and probable. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great night.